Hey, you don't want to miss this. This is our June update. What's going on with the control and compound? What's going on in the market? Bitcoin, real estate, inflation, interest rates. We're going to dig into it all. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Control and Compound. I'm Darren Mitchell. And joining me as always, Christina White. Christina, how are you doing this morning? Hi, Darren. I am doing great. We're heading into a June update, summertime, one of my favorite times. So i uh, having a great day. How about you? Uh, I'm, uh, I'm excited. Still still recovering from our last conference, uh, getting back on track. But uh, all kinds of stuff to talk, talk about uh, for this update. So let's start with uh, the Bank of Canada. What's going on with interest rates? So that is a hot topic right now. We don't have our um, actual update from Bank of Canada until June 5th. So on June 5th, they're going to make their announcement. Um, it's still 5% right now. 75% uh, of economists are saying that we are probably going to see a 25-point cut to 4.75%, 4, 4 and that there will be at least three more rate cuts before the end of the year. This is what this is what the predictions are saying. Now, we're, we've are we got to look at inflation and those things that lead to these predictions, um, right. but inflation has been within 1% to 3% target for a few months now. So in April, it was actually down to 2.7%, um, which is down from March, which was 2.9%. And the April figures are actually the lowest that we've seen since March 2021 at 2.2%. So it is, we are seeing that trending of inflation going down. Now, if you go to the grocery store, I don't think you're going to feel the exact the exact same. Um, food prices still rose in April. Um, they're saying it happened at a lower pace. So 1.4% compared to 1.9%, but food was up 1.4%. Um, and gas was up 6.1% overall in April after a 4.5% increase in March. So we all kind of know where that came from with the carbon tax and whatnot. So um, for the consumer, I don't think that you're feeling so much the inflation slowing, but from Statistics Canada, they are saying that we are seeing, um, you know, we are seeing that lower inflation rate. We yeah. also, um, a couple neat things that I was reading through, well, I don't know about neat, but when we're talking about inflation, StatsCan did report that in Alberta, where we have seen a lot of like inflation was slower than some of the other provinces, um, the cost of rent rose 16.2% in April. So if you're in Alberta and you're paying rent, you definitely didn't notice the inflation <laughs> decrease. That definitely went up. Um, and that grew faster than the pace of the national rate, which was 8.2% for the uh, eighth month in a row. And that's kind of coming from strong um, migration from elsewhere in Canada. Um, people are moving to Alberta and everything's kind of going up. So it you know, inflation slower overall, which is going to lead, well, they're thinking is going to lead to that um, rate cut. Um, but for the average Canadian, we're not actually experiencing it. Uh, Macklem actually said, we are going to see need to see displacement continue for longer to be confident that progress toward price stability will be sustained. So yeah. we can't be for sure that on June 5th, awesome. we're going to see that cut. Uh, but it is, you know, it's looking more, more like that. The other reason that uh, we might see it happen very slowly, if at all, is that our neighbors in the U.S. have not decided to cut, like they've decided not to make any cuts. Like they're talking more like September before we're going to end up seeing some rate cuts in the U.S. Uh, and we can't, you know, like we can't just start declining with uh, if they're not as well. So it's going to show how fast ours will fall based on how quickly they're going to do theirs as well. So they're Another little thing that they're concerned about, obviously, is if they start um, cutting rates, the prices of houses are going to go up, right? We're going to see that market kind of surge is what they're thinking. And the average home price has already tripled in nearly two dec decades and surged over 50% during uh, the pandemic. So a couple things that they're keeping in mind when they're making these decisions. Uh, but overall, like 75% are saying on June 5th that we may see those um, interest rates start to fall. Yeah. And I mean, on, on inflation, it's the pace of inflation that's slowing. It's still, prices are still going up, but they're just, the pace is going up and we're not going to, we're not making up for the you know, like 50% increase in housing in the last two years. Like those things are not going down if they're just increasing at a smaller rate, but we already have this huge spike that we've had over the last couple of years. And, and just last comment on inflation. I always talk about this, like the CPI is almost irrelevant for the average person because everyone has their own inflation rate. If you're a young Canadian and you're about to buy your first home, 
Well, your infl- your inflation was up a lot more than two, three, four, five, six, seven percent because so much of your income is going to go towards housing costs, even if it's rent or or if it's mortgages with the interest rates and the increase in price. So if you've got forty percent of your income going to housing and that increased fifty percent, well, you know. I don't care what in, what they say inflation is. Your inflation is a lot higher. Same if you wanted to buy a basket of goods such as the, the S&P 500. Well, you know, that's up 50% the last couple of years. So you want to buy that basket of good. If you're an investor, your inflation is considerably higher. So, you know, for overall, I guess it's good news. Um, but don't be misled that just because inflation is slowing doesn't mean it's going to get super easy to buy a house now. Uh, those housing prices haven't, haven't really moved much. No. And the other thing that I wanted to note too, is that we have to remember that even if we see that rate cut, it's not actually going to, we're not going to feel any effects of it for 12 to 14 months. Like we saw that on the other side, we didn't see impacts immediately when those interest rates go up, what went up, and we're not going to see it immediately when those interest rates start to fall either. This is a 12 to 14 month lag before we're going to start seeing um, Mm -hmm. the true impacts of that, you know, ease up on the interest rates. Well, I wish, I wish you'd let me know exactly when it's going to drop and how much, Christina, because I got some income properties I need to refinance, and I'd really like to know when, right? That's a million-dollar question. Uh, yeah, and one of the issues, too, if we drop rates and, and, and the U.S. doesn't, is what, what effect that's going to have on the Canadian dollar. So how's the Canadian dollar doing these days? Pretty steady at 73 cents. So it's 73 cents to the U.S. dollar. We haven't seen much change to it. Um, the last change was when, you know, they were talking about announcements back in April. Uh, so we could see something change in uh, June when they make this next announcement. Uh, again, if the feds aren't making um, their, if they're not making their changes and we are, that does impact our dollar, which which is why we're probably not going to see a huge drop um, at, at a time. Anyways, we're going to see very slow decreases. But today, as of today, it's 73 cents on the dollar, the Canadian dollar. So, Okay. And then jump into the stock markets. Uh, the U.S. and Canada were both kind of flat last month. U.S. was up slightly. Canada's up like 1%. Uh, year to date, the S&P 500 is up 10% in the States. And uh, the Canadian S&P TSX is up uh, 5% year to date. So Again, we get the, the U.S. outperforming Canada, continuing to do that. And then uh, always exciting bit, Bitcoin news. Uh, and again, we're, we're not Bitcoin experts. We're not recommending you buy Bitcoin. This is just a, a information session on Bitcoin. Um, but uh, BlackRock, their ETF now is the largest uh, ETF. They surpassed Grayscale. So they're, they're over $20 billion on that one specific uh, Bitcoin spot ETF. Um, and then it's another interesting, uh, research report came out on Bitcoin and it talked about the rule of 10 or people call it different things, but it talks about, it was from a uh, fun strat. They came out with stats saying there's 10 days a year where almost all the gains in Bitcoin happen. So in other words, if you're trying to buy and sell Bitcoin and trying, it, it's, it's almost impossible because if you miss those 10 days, you're going to miss almost all the all the own gains. So this pattern's remained consistent since 2013. So in 2021 in the bull market, the top 10 days of the year saw a 179% increase. So just 10 days in 2021, 179% increase um, compared to minus 43 for the rest of the 355 days. So it's really important you stay, you stay, if you're in Bitcoin, you stay invested in that Bitcoin and don't try to trade it. Um, 2019, when we had the bear market, uh, 217% on those 10 days, minus 39. So again, we're seeing the same thing this year, 10 days this year, it increased 52%. Um, so that's really all the, all the, all the increase we've had. So Bitcoin's trading around 70,000 now, give or take, it's up about 14% on the past month, uh, and, uh. Fifty-seven uh, percent year to date, and still one hundred and fifty percent over a one-year one-year point. A um, couple of interesting things too. Some of the corporations now are starting to buy Bitcoin, and this is the acceptance, you know, adoption when companies started buying, like MicroStrategy is the big one, of course. Michael Saylor, they they invest in Bitcoin, but uh, similar Scientifics, they bought uh, five hundred and eighty-one Bitcoin last month. Uh, drove their stock price up by 25%. So you're seeing some of these companies now with excess cash saying, you know, we should put a portion of that money uh, into Bitcoin. And we're seeing some funds, some of the BlackRock funds where it's a, 
a fund of funds where they have all different indexes. Some of those funds now are allocating like one in 2% to Bitcoin. And I think that'll really help the adoption of Bitcoin if we can have um, ha have these like mutual funds or, or, or even like uh, index funds say, we're going to put a portion of our assets in Bitcoin or Bitcoin ETF. Uh, that should help us. But but I want to share a Bitcoin uh, uh, story here. So I was I was... I was sending money to the U.S. and I had to send, it was like less than 50 grand Canadian, but it was, I was doing a purchase in the States and I tried to use PayPal to, to pay for this because I had to pay in American dollars and my bank wouldn't let me transfer that much to PayPal. And then we had to split it in three transactions and that wasn't working. So then I had to go send a bank wire and I waited 29 minutes and line up at the bank. It took me about an hour, hour to get actually that wire transferred transfer done. So this took like three and four days to transfer the money and then it's in transit. And 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 the the person I was sending the money to said, or you can send me Bitcoin. It'll be about $10 in service fees. No, no exchange where they screw you on the exchange at the bank and I'll have it in 10 minutes. And I was like, I don't want to sell my Bitcoin, but like that's, the, I think that's the future. Like when you start sending money to other countries, and you see how cumbersome it is and the fees and the exchange rates you pay. Um, you know, fast forward, I don't know if it's five years, 10 years, 20 years, but at some point, the the ease of of, of transactions, especially from country to country uh, with Bitcoin, uh, I think that that adoption will happen. I don't know when, but anyway, all kinds of cool stuff about uh, Bitcoin. Um, we'll see. We'll see next month. There'll be all pro probably all kinds of exciting changes happening in Bitcoin there. So, Christine, you mentioned real estate going, um, not really moving much. What's what's what are the numbers in Canada the last month? So, with real estate, national home sales have declined one point seven percent month over month in April, wow. um, and the number of newly listed properties rose about two point eight percent month over month. So, um, you know, sales are not popping off. Although we did talk about it, a lot of people are kind of holding off um, for that, maybe for that interest rate announcement before jumping in. Now, looking at appreciation across the markets and what that you know what that looks like overall, there's been some serious appreciation in home prices or you know increases in home prices across the country uh, not in your typical areas like if we look at BC they're up about 2.1 percent their average benchmark home price is up 2.1 percent per year Ontario's down a bit at minus one percent so that's some of those bigger you know those more expensive homes are not uh, they're not as increasing as rapidly as we've seen them in the past now, if we go out to Alberta though 9.3 percent um, increase over the years New Brunswick right there at 9.3 percent as well so two very hot spots for appreciation looking at these numbers anyways um, for this month we've also seen you know for looking at Nova Scotia 4.6 percent uh, Newfoundland five 5.8%. So we're still seeing that incre increase in uh, in uh, home price, which is which is nice to see. I actually saw a little, there was something in the news uh, yesterday, I want to say, where Trudeau actually said out loud that we need to keep the value of our real estate up because so many people have invested in, the, in, in real estate for their retirement. Completely goes against what he's been saying on trying to get, you know, uh, new, new home buyers into the market and creep, cre increasing uh -huh. those prices. But I think he's going to get, he's He's definitely been called out on that comment, although that comment is actually correct. So, and we are seeing that value. Now, uh, if we look at places like Vancouver, they are thinking that with these interest rate announcements, they might start to see some inventory move. So they're actually, their home listings are 26% above the 10 year seasonal average. So they're not seeing a lot of movement um, in Vancouver, some of those bigger cities. And that's because of capital gains tax increases. They had that Airbnb um, issue and sellers are starting to come to market and they're realizing that the rates are probably going to be higher for longer, right? So they're not seeing things move. Now, they do think with this interest rate cut, we might see the move, but it's not actually because of like, it's not going to decrease the price any because there's still a lot of supply. What it's going to provide is some uh, psychological support for the buyer. They're just going to feel better about the purchase. So we're 
we're thinking that might happen. The other stat while I was going through um, real estate and whatnot, uh, uh, things to talk about today, I had found a Stats Canada report that released that its balance of international payments for quarter one 2024 um, was a lot lower um, from uh, investors abroad. So we're actually losing our reputation as an investment safe haven. So they're starting to see a lot of investors leave Canada, which we're hearing more and more about that. When I'm talking to real estate investors every day, they're talking more about going um, outside of Canada to the US, abroad, lots of different countries. And and reports are starting to show that and confirm that, that we are seeing um, investors leave, <laughs> which isn't great. Uh, so and that's that red tape, those capital gains changes, those types of things, more looking outside of Canada. Now, little neat thing I wanted to share with you, if you are looking outside of Canada, I was on uh, was it TikTok or Instagram the other day, and uh, the home alone house has hit the market. So I don't know if that is a big part, like, I love Home Alone. Um, I've never really seen inside of the house since uh, since the movie was out, but they have the full walkthrough and it even has a basketball court in it. So if you're in the market to go to the US and you've got a solid 5.25 million US that you wanna drop on some history, the Home Alone house is for sale. And I encourage everybody that to go check it out. It was just kind of cool seeing they were showing uh, what the basement, like the creepy basement looks like now versus what it was in the movie. That's where the basketball court is. So it's, it's definitely been redone, but uh, it's worth checking out. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. I love that movie. Uh, cool. On, on to industry news. Uh, you know, one of the things Christine and I do is we're off, we're always meeting with, uh, with insurance companies. Um, they're underwriting apartments, for example. So we met with a couple insurance companies last month to just get updates. And a couple of the cool things, uh, changes in underwriting. Um, insurance companies now are much, or a couple of them, are much more lenient for diabetes, right? Like years ago, if you had diabetes, it's like, yeah, we don't know if we can get you insurance. And if you, if you do get it, it you know, it's going to be a lot, a big rating, like an extra charge. Uh, but insurance companies now have, have really... Uh, I've started to appreciate that there's a wide range, uh, wide, wide range in when it comes to diabetes. Um, so they're, they've streamlined uh, how they underrate diabetes and they're actually getting some really positive outcomes. Like some of them, no, no extra cost at all for diabetes. Again, depending upon how bad it is. Um, but if you've applied in the past or you have diabetes and you're concerned about applying, there, there are avenues now that we we can get you a much better rate than we could before, maybe even a standard rate in some cases. So that was kind of cool. And then with all these new Canadians uh, we have coming, we were always kind of restricted. We, you know, we wanted to wait, the insurance companies wanted them to wait till the new Canadians were permanent residents. Now they've kind of updated that and said, you know, if you've been here six months and you've applied for permanent residency, they're going to provide insurance, I think up to 250 or 500, depending upon the company. And if you're a doctor, engineer, or a lawyer, uh, one of the companies is going up to 10 million, right? So if, if you're a doctor, engineer, or lawyer from another country that's new to Canada, even if you don't have your permanent residency now, uh, we can get up to $10 million for those people and up to 250 or five for everyone else. So that's kind of cool uh, on the underwriting changes. Anything else on underwriting, Christina, from the meeting? Uh, I think you covered it. That diabetes um, thing was pretty cool to hear about the leniency um, and looking and diving a bit more into individuals and not just kind of blanketing. Um, so what, you know, how they're realizing that there's different um, different levels of different conditions and they're digging a bit more into it, which I thought was uh, neat and looking at the big picture. Uh, but yeah, outside, and I'm, I'm super excited about the <laughs> new, uh, new Canadians being able to get their coverage as well. That was something oh. that, we struggled with for a while. So it's nice to see that they're um, easing up on some of those restrictions. And then on economic news, I uh, read a nice report from uh, one of the top Canadian economists, uh, David Rosenberg. Uh, he's the founder of Rosenberg Research. And he's basically saying, you know, if I could define the Canadian economy in one word, weak. Um, so, so he thinks we're probably in a recession already. Uh, now we've been talking, we've been on the cusp of, are we in a recession? Are we not in a recession? You know, what is it? Uh, just another economist coming out saying he thinks at this point, we're probably, probably, you know, in that recession, we'll see how the GDP numbers come out the next few months to, to back that up. But, you know, we are, we are, you know, talking to business owners every single day and, you know, people are feeling the effects of the last couple of years, right? Like the, 
like 12 to 14 months for things to kick in. Well, things have kicked in. Uh, and those increased rates, the increased prices, the labor shortages, all those things are, are impacting uh, the Canadian economy. So that uh, that's going on there. And then the other thing on the economic news, now this is as of June 1st, hopefully it'll be out soon, but I talk to accountants all the time and people are blown away that the capital gains inclusion is going to change in roughly three weeks and we still don't have the legislation out. So there's so many unanswered questions about, you know, if I sell my business, but I don't uh, before the before the June 24th date, but then it doesn't, you know, the, the money's not sent till the fall or if it's a longer closing or, you know, what is the cutoff date for this and that? Can you can, can you can you do a crystallization of your capital gains? Like all these unanswered questions. So you've got millions and millions of dollars on the sidelines right now, people trying to figure out, should I sell now? Should I not sell? You know, the general consensus is, again, not not having the wording is, if you're going to need that money in the next couple of years and you get a stock portfolio with all these gains, maybe it makes sense to 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 take advantage of those or take or to sell some of those and, and, and realize some capital gains. But if you're going to keep it longer than two years, then it may or may not make sense. And again, I'm just relaying what uh, what some of the accountants are telling their clients. Um, but really, the, you know, this is this is almost uncharted territory that a major change in legislation is going to happen weeks away and we still don't know the words the wording of it the legislation of it so uh, a lot of accountants really really just up in arms now saying we, we've got to know the rules before we can advise our clients well this is not the first time that they've done this to accountants this year either right remember the trust situation where they say where they were saying they trust. were going to change all the trust the, they all the, made all the planning for it and they're like yeah we're actually not going to do that anymore we're going we're to change that so i think some people are almost hoping that that might happen with the capital gains now a lot of people are saying don't don't bank on that um but yeah it's not it's not the first time this year that they've uh the accountants they're just they're working for their money this year for sure <laughs> yeah are they ever uh, and then uh, control on compound, we get all kinds of exciting news, Christina. We're doing a bunch of cool things. Uh, what are the highlights for CNC for the month? So this past month, uh, just this last week, we were at the multifamily um, conference in uh, Toronto. That was amazing, huge success. Uh, Seth put on another amazing event. The speakers were out of this world, Darren included. Uh, so we had uh, met so many great people, so much networking to be done. It was yeah, one of those events that you don't want to miss each year. So uh, great, yeah, just great time being there. We have some more events coming up in the fall. We're not going to release them just yet but I promise they're going to be um, really big ones too and exciting uh, that we're going to be attending and speaking at so we've got that on the horizon uh, one of the things that we're working on in-house which I think is I actually really love I'm super excited for this uh, but we are implementing EOS in our uh, in our offices and we're just getting into that so that processing I don't know I'm sure there's a lot Darren there's a lot of business owners out there that use EOS right like this is not new this is pretty standard. So I'm excited that we're getting into it. It's a new learning curve, but I think it's going to be really exciting. Um, and I think we should chat about it more as we go. Now we've got our first meeting on Monday, so we don't know, you know, we're still rolling into this, but we'll definitely share with you our experience as we go through it and as we implement it. So that's exciting. Um, and then this month as well, we're actually heading to a conference in the U.S. where we're going to meet up with Garrett Gunderson. So if you, didn't, if you missed that episode, you have to go back. Um, and we've got an episode with Scott Donald coming out. Um, he's based in the U.S. as well uh, with an exciting uh, new product that he's offering, book that's going to be released. Anyways, we're going to be chatting with them this month. And then we're going to have some big news coming up with some partnerships and uh, generational wealth planning we're going to be putting a focus on, which is exciting. So tons Tons of uh, new stuff happening at, happening at Control and Compound. We're definitely keeping busy, aren't we, Darren? Are we ever? Uh, okay, and then uh, podcast wise, we had a, we had some really cool ones. You mentioned the Garrett Gunderson. That was last month. Uh, if, if you if you haven't read any of Garrett's books or, or follow Garrett, he is just he he's in, he's in, he's incredible. Uh, we did a podcast on the insured retirement program. Uh, we had another one on surprising paths to insurability. It was kind of cool. We get a lot of feedback. On that one, people say, "Oh, I always assumed I couldn't couldn't be insurable, or I didn't know I could do this, or I didn't know I could do that." Um, and then we did our live podcast from the multifamily. 
Uh, we really like that one. We got some control and compound members on that that you don't normally see. Uh, just, you know, two or three minutes with a bunch of people. Then we interviewed some real estate investors at the conference, see what they're doing, what, what they're investing in. And uh, that podcast, check that one out. And then uh, coming up this month, what do we have, Christina? So as I mentioned, we have Scott Donald on the podcast. He's going to be talking about his book, Value Creation Kid, oh. and their program, Gravy Stack, which um, teaches uh, parents how to teach their kids val how to create value in this world. Super cool. You don't want to miss this one. It's very interesting. Um, we're also going to be doing the corporate insured retirement program. So if you listen to our uh, podcast on the insured retirement program, so that was more geared towards okay. the personal side, we have a whole podcast on the corporate side. So if you are a corporate business owner, you oh. absolutely are going to want to take a listen to this podcast. It is for you. We are going to continue our Nelson Nash series. We're doing the retirement trap. I liked this one. This was a good one. Um, we also have a podcast on reasons why you need life insurance. So why you need it. So if you're questioning the need for life insurance, that's a podcast you're going to want to check out. Uh, as well, Darren and I are doing um, some more, some shorter, like quick, quick ah. version podcasts that are going to be appearing on YouTube. So if you don't follow us on YouTube yet, uh, in order to see that uh, short, those shorter podcasts, that extra information and tidbits, make sure that you um, hit oh, hit up uh, YouTube and subscribe, hit the bell button so you always see that new content when it's coming out. Awesome. Okay, that's the monthly update for June. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Thanks for watching this episode of Control and Compound. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell button so you never miss a new episode. And if you're ready to learn more, head to our website, controlandcompound.com. The link's below.